What is going on, everybody? We are at the end now of the testimony. We are at the final piece here. We are calling Timothy Shedd Jr. back to the stand. Um, you might know him as Lady Frame. Uh, the court says, you do remain under oath. And he replies, yes, ma'am, I declare, I do believe that I have understood my rights as they have occurred. That's exactly how he talks in my mind. I'm not sure how he talks in real life. I heard it on Altcoin Daily, but I assume that was a voice synthesizer to make him sound like a real boy. So uh, let's get into this. Um, he has been previously duly sworn. And now Mr. Norris starts off. And let's kick this into gear. Welcome back, Mr. Shedd. I have a few things to hit on you from your testimony this morning, and a little business, and then we'll be done. Mr. Shedd, do you recall during your examination earlier, there was a discussion about the timing of the expulsion letter? Yes, that was marked as plaintiff's exhibit one, correct? Uh-huh. Okay, and I believe your testimony was that you delivered this to Mr. Armstrong on August the 27th. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, and did counsel facilitate in the preparation of this letter? Yes, all right. And there's, if you had that, do I have a binder up there? I do. Okay. Anyway, could you turn to PAB 15, please? Do you recognize the exhibit? I'll mark as defendant's exhibit 15, sir. Yes. What is, it's a consent action. Yes. What is that document? This is the consent action that was included with the letter. And what is the purpose of the consent action? It is to inform Mr. Armstrong of his removal. His removal from what? BJ Investment Holdings and its subsidiaries. And what's the date on this document? Uh, 25th, August 25th, 2023. Turn to the last page. Are those your signatures on the document, sir? Yes. Okay. Did you have assistance from counsel in preparation of this document? Yes. All right. And was it also delivered to Mr. Armstrong on De December the 27th? Yes. If there's no objection, I move for, I assume this is going to be August the 27th, not December the 27th, by the way. If there is no objection, I move for D15 to be admitted. And seven says no objection. And the court says admitted with no objection. All right. Now, I don't know if you have it up here still, but plaintiff's exhibit two, the text message. Do you recall the testimony about that? Uh-huh. You, you have to answer yes or no. Yes. All right. So there was some discussion with my colleague regarding the text message in this exhibit, sir. And so questions about whether Mr. Armstrong had informed you that you would be leaving the company prior to the expulsion letter marked as plaintiff's exhibit one. Do you recall that exchange? Yes. Okay. Now, Ms. Evans asked you, strike that. If you look at page one of plaintiff's exhibit, there was this text exchange dated August the 20th, where Mr. Armstrong states that, you know, quote, as soon as I can, I'm going to find someone to do your job and you can take your 33% and go home and collect it. Do you see that? Uh, I don't see it, but I recall it. Yeah. I apologize. Let me hand you what's marked. Um, I just want to make sure you have it. Do you recall discussing that text message, sir? Yes. Now, did Mr. Armstrong state in the text message that he had taken action pursuant to the operating agreement to disassociate you as a member of BJ Investment Holdings? No. Did he state that he was in any way rescinding your membership interest in BJ Investment Holding? No. In text message, Ms. Evans says, Your Honor, counsel, the last two questions, sorry, I was sitting here thinking uh, how that's not what anyone is arguing but he's leading the witness. Uh, you've got him on direct. Don't lead your witness. Uh, in this time period, August the 20, or for that matter, I'll rephrase it for efficiency. At any point prior to delivery of the expulsion letter, uh, did Mr. Armstrong ever tell you that he had taken action to disassociate you as a member of BJ Investment Holding pursuant to the operating agreement? No. When you look at the text message on page one of exhibit two, where he references your 33%, what did you understand that to mean? Um, I understood that to mean my 33% ownership in the partnership, all right? And did he tell you that he was rescinding it or forcing you to give it up in any way? No, all right? Now, Ms. Evans asked you about a separate conversation between you and Mr. Armstrong that prior to, between the date of this August 20 text message and the expulsion letter marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. Do you recall that discussion? Yes, all right? And she played a portion of an audio recording. Do you recall that? Uh-huh. And then she handed you this transcript. By the way, uh-huh, TJ, lady frame, lady frame, grow up, man, man, you boy. Say yes, say no. I remember. I believe it was marked for demonstrative purposes. Do you recall that? Yes. All right. And the relevant portion that was discussed with you earlier were some statements by you in this audio recording to that effect that I quote, I was just basically, you made it very clear that there was not, you were not going forward. We were not moving forward. We were done, et cetera. Do you remember that discussion? Uh-huh. <sighs> fucking guy. All right. What if you flip to the cover of the transcript? What's the date on that audio recording? Uh, September 6, 2023. Okay. Is that before or after you sent the expulsion letter to Mr. Armstrong? After. Why would you have occasion to say that you understood that Mr. Armstrong had made it clear that you guys were not continuing to do business at that time? Because he had been talking about potentially trying to compromise and do some arbitration to resolve things. And he threatened my life multiple times at this point. He had made it very clear through physical threats that he did not want to continue. Why did he do that? I don't know. He was very angry. 
Okay, were those exchanges, did they occur before or after the expulsion letter? After, basically, after he got the expulsion letter, he got, he wasn't accepting the expulsion and he was fighting very much dramatically and didn't want to go our separate ways. And that's part of what he was talking about on that call, I believe, or earlier parts of that call. He was wanting to meet with some arbitration person to see if there was anything we could do not to separate. Later in this transcript, there's a reference to a person demoted as Dave. Now, let me say Dave is, uh, you know what, Dave, by the way, the, the, is, is the man of the fellowship of the Christian Leadership Board, who is also TJ's mentor. So basically, uh, Dave and TJ were trapping Ben in something to catch him. In case you were wondering, uh, we had this conversation, you listened to the document, you heard the recording from Ben Armstrong a few months back. So, uh, but I digress, let's get back into this. Uh, later in this transcript, there's a reference to a person named Dave. Who is that? He's my business mentor, the chair of our C12 boards at Christian Leadership Board. Why was he participating in this call? He was the one we were supposed to be meeting at his house to potentially arbitrate or potentially have discussions on how things could be resolved. I know you're not a lawyer, but do you know if you are referring to arbitration or mediation? I guess mediation is probably what I'm talking about. Fair enough. You can put that aside, all right? The court says, due to the time, I'm going to give you five more minutes. Fair enough, Your Honor. So ask your most important questions. Mr. Shad, I'm going to see if this court will allow me to do this as efficiently uh, for efficiency's sake. But do you recall earlier I went through your Mr. Armstrong a series of corporate documents concerning REBJ, and I'll direct you to that binder, tabs 14, 15, and 16. I'm sorry, strike that. Tabs 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. It should be tabs 18 through 24. Yes, I recall those documents. Are you familiar with those documents? Sir, yes. Did you sign all those? Yes, it looks like it again. It looks like it. State that again. Yes, I did. Mr. Norris says, Your Honor, if there's no objection, I would like to move for the admission of D18 through D24. No objection. Admitted without objection. They're all admitted. Now, very quickly, if you could turn uh, to its foundational matter. Do you agree that Mr. Armstrong, uh, that at some point Mr. Bo Mason became a member of REBJ? Yes. Uh, Bo Mason was a friend of Ben's that he wanted to bring into the business. When that when did that occur? Early 2022. Like probably, yeah, I believe it was early February. Are you still a member? Were you still a member at that point? Yes. Was Mr. Armstrong still a member at the point? Yes. Who was the manager of REBG at that point? Before Bo was brought in? No. When he was brought in? When he was brought in, Bo Mason was. If you turn to tab 22, what is this document? It's the resolution of the operating agreement of REBG. What does it purport to state? A transfer of interest to Bo Mason and myself. Are you familiar with this document? Yes. All right. So it indicates in paragraph one that Ben Armstrong owned 67% and TJ Shedd owned 33% of REBJ when it was formed. Do you see that? Yes. And then he, it goes on to state that Mr. Armstrong transferred 17% of his interest to you and 50% to Bo Mason. Do you see that? Yes. Do you agree that that occurred on or about that date? Yes. And then paragraph four states that as of this date, Mr. Armstrong has no ownership interest in REBJ LLC and has no rights as to the management or the control of the operation and affairs of REBJ LLC. Is that correct? Yes. Was that true? Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Leading again. I'm trying to be efficient. The court says, you know what? I'm going to let him be efficient. Understood. Just for a couple more minutes. Thank you for your indulgence. Okay. On the second page of that document, sir, is that your signature? Yes. Why was Mr. Armstrong transferring his interest to Mr. Mason at that time? It's my understanding that we were looking to get a loan and his credit came up as part of the partnership. And the bank said they don't want to, they can't have anyone with his credit profile anywhere associated with the business or partnership in any way. And so he needed to be removed from the partnership. And so he chose to do that. Did he agree to do that? Yes, he did. Did he sign these documents to your knowledge? Yes, he did. Was this March, the resolution you were looking at, dated March 1st, 2022, correct? Yes. To your knowledge, has Mr. Armstrong been a member of REBG or any of his subsidiaries at any point since then? No, strike that. Did Mr. Armstrong receive funds in exchange for the transfer of his interest to you and Mr. Mason? Yes, he did. It was reflect. Is that reflected in one of these documents? It was, okay. And what was that? Where did those funds come from? The proceeds of for a sale of a property owned by REBJ. Did he agree to that? Yes, he did. And to your knowledge, did he sign that document? Yes. Mr. Norris, okay, I want to move on to another topic very briefly. This will be very short, Your Honor. Just a couple of questions, but I think it's important. You understand that the plaintiffs have asked for the appointment of a receiver today, correct? Uh, do you have a general understanding of what that means? Yes. Okay, what what the what is the since the time of Mr. Armstrong expulsion, what is the general operating condition of the company and its finances? If you can tell me from that time to the current time, sure. Obviously, since that time of removal, it has been there's been a lot going on. You know, there's been a lot of changes at the company. We have been adding a new host. We have been approaching new sponsors, and he's not been out there making a lot of noise, creating a lot of allegations and a lot of putting up a lot of roadblocks, I guess you could say, to the business's success. So we've been working really hard to, you know, maintain new partnerships and new sponsorship, raise funds from new investors and all those sort of things. And it's going well, but it's not without its challenges for sure. What happened to the stake sponsorship deal? The stake sponsorship deal, uh, the, the stake sponsorship effectively Ben stole. 
I mean, they asked to go on pause officially when all of this litigation started, but through his persisting, now they are his premier sponsor on his new channel, okay? And as well as one of our other active sponsors that we have had for years. Uh, did that have a financial impact on the company? It had a dramatic financial impact on the company. Does it threaten the company's existence? No, it doesn't threaten its existence. We can overcome it, but it will take time, obviously. How is the company performing today? It's performing much better. Everything is trending in the right direction. Views are trending back in the right direction. We have got great interest from sponsors and investors on multiple different levels. There have been some discussions about steps that were taken to control costs involving HR and payroll. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay, why were those steps taken? To preserve assets and resources. We want to make sure that the company is in the best working order possible. As it was alluded to earlier, we were overstaffed. Many of these people were people that Ben had hired. And when we didn't have the overarching title sponsorship anymore, we had to do what we could to reserve resources and costs and you know move the company forward the best way we possibly could. If a receiver was appointed in your estimation, what impact would that have on the company? Uh, Mrs. Evans says, objection, Your Honor. Speculation, he's not able to. I'll let him answer if he knows. The witness says, yeah. In my opinion, it would be, for lack of a better term, a death knell. Uh, I mean, this is, we are in two very quick, fast-moving industries, social media and crypto asset. It changes very quickly and takes a high level of understanding, both on a social and technical level. So I think, you know, unless you have receivers that have crypto experience and social media experience, which I'm not sure that you do, I would see it as very overbearing challenge. Uh, would it have an impact on your sponsors or investors? Oh, yeah. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, the investors, uh, all right, I'm going to, we're going to be done. So I'm going to let you go back to counsel table. You're not going to get cross again because of time. Go back. I want to hear some closings from you guys. Just, I mean, not long closings, but talking about what you or or don't want me to do today and why. Ms. Seven says, thank you, Your Honor, again for your time today. You've been very generous with us stepping back in. We are asking here for receivership. This is not financial finding of facts in the case. They think they ousted first. We think we ousted first. Time will tell who's right. But in the meantime, just because they got to the locksmith first doesn't mean that they get to take control of everything to the detriment of what might be left for my client, who is still the majority owner. We've gathered a good bit of evidence today, Your Honor, even on this preliminary basis, with not a shred of documents produced from the other side, with zero insight into the books and records, no deposition, nothing like that. But even still, we have, I submit, presented evidence that a receivership is needed to protect the interest of the company in general, and certainly my client's interest as the majority owner, who again, has no vision into the books and records. We've heard testimony today that the defendant's legal fees were being paid for from the company. We have heard admission that there has been no appraisal of my client's interest to have a buyout. While they want to blame that on them, that's a management issue that alone tells you that we might need a receiver. If they don't cooperate and do the things that the business needs to do, even if you assume that's true, then that's another reason for a receiver. They admit that the taxes are not only unpaid, but also unfiled for multiple years. Again, they want to cast blame on my client, but I would say again, even if that were true, there's another management reason. We can't go forward in this state of affairs. The company is going to continue to bleed resources and also be out of compliance with the law for not filing taxes. One brief technical point, and this is that the BJ Investment Holdings Operating Agreement, which was admitted into evidence with no objection, Mr. Shedd, Senior attempted to claim that the taxes are not owed by the company, but section 4.1 is clear that distribution should be paid to the members throughout the year equal to their tax liability. So in effect, they do, and they need to know the amount and it needs to be paid. It might not be paid to the IRS, but it's paid to the members to be paid to the IRS, which is the same thing. So there on the books, we've heard a number. The only numbers we've heard in evidence today is somewhere between one and $5 million that's not being paid in taxes. And whatever they are, they are not being paid. We've heard testimony that the sole member now, Shed Jr., got up here. He can't tell you how much money he's received, how much his wife has received, really what the money has been spent on, other than saying he admits that there's about $2 million worth of transfer, which we discussed, that went to be transferred to cash so that payroll could be paid. But then you heard Mr. Shedd admit that payroll is 70000 a month. Six months of 70000 a month is 420000 Where is the rest of the $1.5 million gone? Where is it? The hundred that my client knows nothing. We've got evidence of property for sale being advertised like almost a fire, almost like a fire sale. We know that the defendants want to claim that my client signed over any interest he had in this real estate. We certainly dispute that, but you don't have to decide that here today because we have an evidence. It was admitted the balance sheet of the real estate holding company showing that it is indebted in over $4 million to the primary company, which should be in receivership anyway. And that's a separate reason why you can do that. Finally, I would say we have got this evidence of employees being cut, payroll being cut, money's going out. We don't know where it is. Even if Mr. Shed Jr. won't admit how much 
he has received over time. He admits that his wife has received money since Mr. Armstrong has been ousted. We've got him and others living rent-free in property that owes money to my clients. We've got every reason, Your Honor, to have a receivership here to make sure that the interest of the company is protected and also my client. In addition to the sole member not knowing anything really about the finances, the person who is the CFO admits no credentials that qualify him for the job. And he's in charge, again, not filing taxes, not performing appraisals, not even offering buyouts, blaming my client. And we have simply got to get a hold around this so that when this litigation is over, there will be something left to fight about. And we are asking your honor to please appoint a receiver. We are prepared to make recommendations as needed once you make the decision. And then the only other thing I would ask you, your honor, because I would love for you to rule on the spot for us. But if this is something that you take under advisement, I would just simply ask that we have at least a very temporary restraining order on any further transfers or sale of property pending your decision. And again, thank you for your time. Mr. Norris says, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. We discussed at the opening notion that this case is new to some folks in this room, but not new to the court system and to the judges who've come before. Mr. Armstrong has previously sought emergency relief. The type he's seeking here today, though, via TRO, has been raised these arguments. Judge Ingram considered them and denied them in a very separate lawsuit. Mr. Armstrong has pursued, by the way, that was over an emergency hearing because they stole his Lamborghini. The Lamborghini that Mr. Shedd himself, senior, said is owned by Ben Armstrong. So, uh, in fact, not the same. Mr. Armstrong has previously sought emergency relief. Mr. Armstrong has pursued other various remedies as discussed. None of them have panned out for him. Every time that he gets a result he doesn't like, he fires his lawyer, hires a new one, and files yet another, you know, temporary request for emergency relief. The only thing that's clear from the evidence here today is that there's no emergency. Every single thing that was raised in their motion has been known about him for many, many months. The Lamborghini issue, we've talked about that. It's not even an issue. It was, as he pled in his complaint, transferred by him voluntarily to someone else. My clients had nothing to do with it. Even the attorney's a liar. You watched it happen, guys. You actually watched this happen. REBJ has no interest in it, and he can sit on the stand and say he didn't sign the documents. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Those are issues that have to be resolved another day, as Ms. Evans indicated. It is not the basis for emergency relief and the appointment of a receiver. The suggestion here that would authorize the type of relief, Your Honor, is that, oh, these properties are all being liquidated and sold off for cash, and people are running away with the money. You didn't hear any of that. All of these properties continue to be held by companies that are owned or controlled by my clients. Not a single one of them has been sold. Not a single one of them has been generating proceeds or is, you know, from a sale that is being misdirected in some way that jeopardizes his ability to recover. Ultimately, those assets are, there's no danger to them whatsoever, and you haven't heard anything to the contrary. I want to discuss, lastly, the company, the request for a receiver over these companies. First of all, the companies themselves, as I mentioned, they have been addressed. The issues that came up today do not demonstrate a single thing about an emergency or about dissipation of assets. What you heard in closing was, oh, they are cutting payroll and they are like reducing benefits or something to some employees. That demonstrates a good stewardship of the assets, not a dissipation. It's, a, it's actually a preservation of capital. And as you heard from Mr. Shedd and from Mr. Shedd Sr., these are the steps that our company should take after Mr. Armstrong has taken action to steal the stake sponsorship worth $1 million. You can't steal a, a sponsorship, by the way. Um, you, you can only let the person go with who they want to be the person that they are partnered with. So uh, good try. And to interfere with the business due to defamatory statements at the various media presences so that the company can operate per, the company is pursuing that on a regular basis. You've heard no evidence that the company, company is in any form of imminent jeopardy. Uh, certainly no evidence suggesting that assets are being transferred out of the account. There was a last minute airmail account to do that vis-a-vis -vis the affidavit of Mr. Tuzinski. None of those facts were in the complaint. None of those facts are in the amended complaint. None of those facts were in the emergency motion for relief. That is the subject of today's hearing. They were sprung on us yesterday. And yet even then, as you have heard through the testimony today, there was an ordinary course business explanation for every one of them. They were used to transfer those assets to a company controlled Gemini account, convert them to cash and wire transfer them back to the company's to pay payroll expenses. And your honor, I will submit to you, we have in response to the receipt of this affidavit, had the opportunity to review some bank account statements and things of that nature that we have not been able to provide because there is not a suitable protective order, but there are records in this case. And one of the most significant dangers of this type of proceeding is that it feels in many ways like a trial and error. 
we are talking about all of these things really merit stakes. But in reality, what we're asking for is not a trial result or a trial verdict. They're asking for a receiver to take over and effectively shut down this company. And as you heard from Mr. Shedd, that would have disastrous consequences. Ultimately, the receiver remedy is used in a very different context when courts use it. You might have a business divorce case where people decided to go separate ways. They fight over how much they owned or whatever it is. And the court says, okay, well, this is not an operating entity. So, but I don't want one of you to have a signature authority on the bank account to go and raid the bank account and steal the assets and disappear. So I'm going to appoint a receiver, have them take hold of the assets and ensure that they are preserved. That would make sense if this were that type of case. It is, it is not, <laughs> it is, it is. This is an operating company that is involved in a very dynamic space in the cryptocurrency industry. They're making daily decisions regarding investing in cryptocurrency and various content that they produce, none of which will be understood in any way, shape or form by a receiver. They are making deals with investors, with sponsors, again, something that can't logistically be done or conducted in the context of a receiver. And the plaintiffs ultimately know this. Their plan and their view of all of this is that if they can jam this through on a very thin evidentiary record by submitting affidavits and evidence that wasn't tendered to us in, a way, in any way until yesterday, all of which is concerning matters that they have known about for months, that by hook or by crook, they can find a way to get the receiver appointed and shut this company down. And it will effectively destroy Mr. Shedd's company. It's Ben Armstrong's company, bitch. Uh, and all of the businesses and assets that it controls and effectively end the employment of all the people who work there. Now, that may be a good fodder for Mr. Armstrong as revenge. I don't know, but it's not an appropriate remedy for the court to consider at this juncture. And it's certainly not appropriate as an evidentiary record that has been created. It most certainly is because the reasons for the separation of the company were unfounded. And, and the last thing I want to discuss, Your Honor, is with concern to the discussion of taxes. You heard the testimony today. There were issues related to the preparation of the tax returns. They are outside tax consulting companies who are working on that act. And there's no reason for that, crop for, that they need cooperation with him going forward. The entity that withdrew at the time of the separation occurred. It's not an issue that's ongoing. And they're preparing their tax returns now. If there's a tax liability existed before Mr. Armstrong was expelled from the company, it's not an emergency. It's not evidence of a dissipation of asset. It's not anything that justifies the appointment of a receiver. We think this is. I would finally note and leave on this. The Georgia courts are very clear that the appointment of a receiver and to the extent that the court would entertain a temporary restraining order is an extraordinary remedy. It should be resorted to only in the most extreme cases and based on a very clear evidentiary record that there is a need for that remedy to be preserved so that the assets can be protected from the ultimate judgment that will come from the court through the jury. There's no evidence that justifies that. I've heard nothing. And finally, with respect to a receiver, if a receiver is in point, I'm not sure how they can honestly function. They're going to go uh, to Mr. Armstrong and say, okay, what is it I need to take charge of? The testimony you heard from Mr. Armstrong is he doesn't know who signs what. He doesn't know what documents are official or forged or fake. He is just going to throw up his hands and say, I don't know. I mean, how is a receiver supposed to even work with that? The receiver is effectively just going to end up going to TJ and saying, okay, what's the truth? So that's the problem with someone who just wants to point fingers at everybody and has no real concept of what actually was going on according to his own sworn testimony. And a receiver cannot effectively operate in that context. So it's not going to do anything except lead to a very punitive result that he seeks to create leverage against my clients, your honor. For that reason, we would ask the court to deny. So the court says, um, I tell you where I don't want to be a fly on the wall. And that's in the deposition of this case, because you guys kind of did a little mini deposition today. And when, if, and when you get around to that point, let me know. So I can call on uh, any forms of deposition. So you don't have to suspend depositions. Counsel, this is extremely litigious and extremely contiguous. And I get it. I don't want you all to talk about whether we are going to consolidate everything into one. And I think we have got some parties missing because Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Shedd individually don't own anything that I heard today. They have companies that own. So I'm not sure where those, how we need to work around those. So I agree with both sides on some points and I'm going to give y'all some. I'm going to give you my thoughts and charges and, and charge y'all with coming up with a perhaps a solution that satisfies my concerns and thoughts. I'm not inclined to appoint a full receiver to take over these businesses. You have certainly convinced me that this is a very specialized world. It's a very, I think Mr. Shedd testified. I don't think who would, who I would even ask. And that's fine. I don't think that that's what is needed here today. I think the people who operate in this crypto whatever world need to keep doing what it is that they do. On the flip side, the financial aspects of it, that's not rocket science. That's not anything clever. Bank records and balance sheets and P&Ls and tax liabilities and what's an appropriate operating expense and what's a distribution, what is not categorized as a distribution, but is really is a distribution. That's the world of forensic accounting. And they're quite capable of taking something like that on. And I believe that under the statutes, both 981 and 983, I can appoint a receiver kind 
for a limited purpose of, and I haven't decided yet whether it's going to be just reviewing financials, gathering information about operations or reviewing them, or if it's going to be in the role of a certain threshold. This person, whether we call it a receiver or a special master, how we figure it out, they need to come to the court for approval on certain types of expenditures, certain types of things that might be, look, you guys are really good lawyers. I've been doing this for a while. You know where the gray area is on closely held businesses. Um, it's there. We all know it. It's fine. It's not, it's not a hugely problematic until the owners are in litigation. And then you've got to figure out what's right. Uh, so that is what I'm inclined to have someone do. And I haven't fully kind of fleshed out what that looks like. We have got to, we've got really good lawyers in this case. And I would like for y'all to put your collective heads together. I don't want to shut the business down. I do think there's a dispute over whether the expulsion has been fully effectuated. And I mean, I've looked through the operating agreement that you guys have put in. I'm sure there's going to, this is going to be heavy litigated. I do think that whoever I appoint, and I mean, I really do think somebody, a forensic accountant type is what I'm looking at in more of a reviewing kind of capacity than a controlling capacity. I know who I hear from a regular basis, primarily through in domestic cases, but I'll let you give me some names now that I have told you that uh, y'all are going to split the cost 50-50 and subject to reallocation letter if necessary. There is a testimony from Mr. Shedd, unclear about tax liability. I will tell you after listening to all the financials, the testimony about the finances, I do have concern on whether this company is solvent at this point in time or not, or if anyone knows if it's solvent or not, and all of you lawyers, they've got to get paid. So, and a receiver or a special master or whatever we deem has got to get paid. Mr. Shedd mentions arbitration or mediation. And I saw it also mentioned in a text message. Y'all thought, y'all ought to think about that. I understand that there's a lot of feelings of betrayal and a lot of feelings of anger. But at the end of the day, and if this drags out really, really long, the lawyers are going to be the winners here because they are the ones who are going to get paid. So the parties might want to think about putting their, at one point in time, you have all been really good business people. So put that business hat back on and think about it. Do I have questions for me? Not arguments, but questions. Uh, uh, Ms. Evans says, I have one question, Your Honor. When you say you want us, I presume you want us to work together on a proposed order. Court says that if you can't work together on it, which is quite possible given what I have seen today, then you just send me each what you want to do. And then my second question is that when you say the cost will be split, you had heard some testimony today about the company resources being used for theirs. You mean individually? Well, right now there's only individual parties in the case. Individuals should be paying. So that's how that would look in this particular case. I don't know what kind of money people have got, but that's how it would look in this case. And that's also, I mean, I heard their fees were being paid. So we need to look. That's why we need a forensic accountant to come in and figure out what's what. Uh, Mr. Yalkin says, Your Honor, just for clarification, when it comes to the division of financial responsibilities to pay the special master, that wouldn't include my client, would it, Your Honor, because he's not a member of the businesses who are fighting here today. You know what? I will consider a proposal. I haven't heard much from your client. I heard some about yours. Uh, and this is some other attorneys here uh, piggybacking on that same thing. My client, do you hear something about she's not a member, a former employee? Uh, this would be somebody previous. I think it's Allison, probably. Uh, she left employment there five or six months ago. So that was the only point that I would make. The court says, all right, so you guys might have to convince me that it just needs to be Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Shedd splitting it. Thank you, Your Honor. And also just to help things move forward, because I probably won't be involved in those negotiations. But is Your Honor referring to Lori Dyke at IAG? Yeah. I mean, obviously, Lori has done a lot of work. And when I was in private practice, I even hired her to evaluate closely held businesses and things like that. Um, moving on just a little bit here. The only thing I'm thinking through is that we haven't really addressed it yet, but the court talked about consolidating. Y'all need to talk about that and figure that out. Understood. It's just what they are. There are also some entities in some of these cases uh, that impacts the cost and whatever. So much fun. This is going to be so much fun. Mr. Lambro says, I did have something just really quick, but you had mentioned earlier that the parties need to get together and do some sort of restraining order or something like that. We didn't get together during the break, which is fine. But, you know, Judge, if that's what you want, now that the parties are here before we enter, and it may be a good idea for the court to say something about that. Yeah, y'all need to leave each other alone. Everybody, don't. On that side, on this side, stay away. Don't talk to each other. Don't bother each other. Uh, that's what you've got lawyers for. Do not make it worse and do not make me go digging into my powers and figuring out what I can do to people and what I can't. Don't just don't do it. I don't know how else to say that. And the lawyers can put that into nice lawyer, lawyerly language. But yeah, don't do it. And you guys can talk later about kind of what you, I mean, all of the cases are with me. I even have his divorce. So all of it is with me. And I understand that there have been other judges that may have done things, but now you've got me for better or for worse. So let's all be mindful of that. And I understand how much this litigation means to the parties on all sides. I get that, but we're going to go through in the way that our system is designed for it to go through. And a protective order, I will do a, if you guys do, I will do some sort of protective order. Y'all work that out. You can have some attorneys, uh, eyes only stuff if you want. I think that's a great idea. Uh, Koenig says, 
Uh, I'm not in this case, but I have a bunch of other cases with you in the businesses. I think there's a likely status conference coming up. Yeah, we can all be excused for that. Um, and in summary, the court says, all right, any other questions from counsel uh, to clear this out? There is no other questions. And that closes it out. And that is the end of it. So as of this point, receiver has been appointed. And uh, we are, Lori, whatever her name is, uh, has been appointed as a receiver for the, the company. Uh, as you've seen, there was an allegation over $2 million moved out to pay for payroll. That's about $70,000 over six months is $400,000. So uh, the question is, where's that other $1.5 million? Um, and, you know, there are some fair questions to um, this was at one time a $40 million company that apparently TJ has turned into a struggling to survive company. However, he has millions of dollars worth of assets in real estate and wants to keep it all for himself as he steals this company. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below. This is a fascinating situation. And I think that it will work itself out given a little bit of time. Remember, there had to be calls, there had to be purposes, and there had to be reasons in the business operating agreement for the separation of the two entities. And uh, TJ, as the architect of that contract, uh, was probably all along trying to steal the company from Ben Armstrong. Um, it, it looks like it that way, but he gave reasons. He gave reasons. The reasons were, and by the way, if you want, we can play that, but the reasons were that he was having an affair with Cassie. It's not illegal. It's not a reason to give up a company. He was paying a Cassie illegally with corporate funds. Uh, Tim, said, Tim Shedd Sr. proved that that, in fact, was a lie. The Lamborghini was, in fact, owned by Ben Armstrong. Now, despite the fact that the judge in this situation said, well, you know, and, and the attorney said, well, he did sign it over to somebody else. He was being threatened by Carlos to be put under a prison. That's called murder. Um, and he was being threatened for money because uh, Justin Williams stole money from Vumio for the investors. And this is wild. And Ben got caught in the middle of this because um, he trusted um, Lady Frame to be a man frame. And he wasn't. He was a Lady Frame. So uh, when you trust a Lady Frame, you get Lady Frame results, I guess. You know, so uh, hopefully this is a lesson learned. And um, maybe, just maybe, we'll see some kind of uh, uh, some kind of resolution to this coming forward. Uh, in fact, if you have any questions about this, I suggest that you go back to Altcoin Daily. Uh, for questions about Bitboy Crypto. And you can see where uh, Altcoin Daily says, well, what about the Bitboy Crypto name? Why would you keep that? And TJ says, <laughs> well, I declare he could use that for himself. We don't even do anything with it. We don't even care. And then uh, Ben does that. And TJ says, he can't do that. Oh, I declare, I declare, I'm starting to get warmed up for this. Whatever he says, I don't know how he talks it in real. I mean, he just, it just sounds like that. I feel like I'm right. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm right. So that wraps it up. Now I'm just kind of giving you my hyperbole sort of answers to it to just keep this going to the 30 minute mark. We're past 30 minutes now. So we're going to get out of here. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe button, the bell to be notified and share this with as many people as possible. Make sure that it trends on X. Let's get this thing out for everybody so that everybody can see what a dirtbag organization Hit Networks truly is. And remember, this is not financial advice, but I'm always